Ah, thank you very much. Uh, my Swiss watch is telling me that it is 4.30 p.m., so it's time to go. So welcome back for this uh, uh, second half of uh, Daryl uh, presentation. Uh, as mentioned just a little earlier, um, for this, uh, uh, for today, I think uh, I will um, ask you, if you have questions, use the chat as, as, as usual. But eventually, depending on the question, uh, I'll, I'll stop Daryl and give you the word so you will be able to ask your question. So without you, uh, Daryl, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Thank you, Mark. Uh, welcome, welcome back. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to pick up where we uh, left off. And, um, and that was really with some interesting questions. So I'm going to start off by just reminding you of, of um, what the overview is all about. And then I want to I want to try to answer one of the questions that came up on Monday. Okay, so um, it's it's a synthesis talk. I want to talk about the synthesis of uh, particularly oxide interfaces and using epitaxy as a way to um, unleash these uh, these hidden properties that um, can be can be unleashed in a number of ways. Uh, might all sound like uh, modern alchemy, but uh, the trick that we talked extensively about last time was strain engineering. I want to get as far as I can in, in, in my lecture today with some other, other tricks. But um, really, I'm, I most like to, to uh, cover things in a clear way. So if there are questions, please ask your questions. I'd much rather uh, you know, uh, answer things than uh, cover all of the slides that I have, because I have an, an enormous number of slides. OK. So last time, I got a great question about uh, europium titanate and um, why it was that films made by different techniques showed um, different properties. Um, you know, being that in, in bulk, in single crystals, it's antiferromagnetic, and yet I showed these results from films that were grown by pulse laser deposition that showed um, startlingly different properties. They were ferromagnetic no matter what the substrate the film was grown on. And furthermore, they didn't have the same, uh, even in an unstrained, even when deposited on strontium titanate, which has the identical lattice constant, 3.905 angstroms as europium titanate. Uh, the, the peaks of the films were at different positions than the substrate. Uh, they're both cubic at room temperature, so very strange. Um, and, and the question was, was why? Okay, um, and I, you know, I mentioned that you know, I thought maybe it was bombardment. But I, 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 um, I want to point to a group that solved the problem. And um, the way that they solved it was they made their films by PLD. They had extended lattice constants and showed ferromagnetism. Okay. But they annealed them in air, one atmosphere of air, at 400 degrees C, which is like a typical temperature where you get a lot of oxygen uptake for 24 hours. And that um, drastically changed the structure so here in the, on the left-hand side, you can see that the peak of the strontium titanate substrate and the peak of the film are uh, on top of each other. It's a good sign. <laughs> and over here on the right, you see the properties drastically changed. So as deposited, it showed ferromagnetism, whereas when, after they did this anneal, um, it, it has become in the antiferromagnetic state. So this, you know, this definitely suggests that, that there were oxygen vacancies or, or some sort of vacancy complex that uh, was resulting in the ferromagnetism seen in these, um, in these PLD films. I should point out that the, the, the route to doing this wasn't as easy as just taking a film and annealing it. Um, if they did that, uh, europium uh, likes to become three plus. And so what would happen is the entire film would, uh, would try to convert and, and they went from an epitaxial film actually to an amorphous film. So by putting a capping layer of strontium titanate on the whole thing, they can find it from both sides with strontium titanate and um, that kept the europium titanate from breaking, uh, breaking down and allowed them to, to get the intrinsic, uh, intrinsic properties. Okay, so just to, to follow up on that, on that question. Um, but while I was talking about it, just the differences between different growth techniques and you know, it's how important control experiments are, I thought I would also you know, have a look at uh, the model system of all perovskites, which is strontium titanate. And, in, in, uh, you know, although people have been making epitaxial films of perovskites for, for decades, 
it's only in the recent, uh, recent couple of decades that people have done homoepitaxy, like strontium titanate on strontium titanate. And that's where surprising things began to be seen. So this early work from Jim Speck's group using uh, pulse laser deposition, this is all PLD work. Um, the film peak is not on top of the substrate peak, even though this is strontium titanate being grown on strontium titanate. And it depends very much on the growth pressure at which the film is being deposited. So you can see as, as, as they go to lower pressure where um, you know, the bombardment effects are gonna be larger. The, the species that leave the target at tens or hundred of uh, electron volts um, are gonna have fewer collisions on the way to, this, to the substrate. And they're gonna arrive with larger energies and they're gonna have a chance of doing some bombardment. And I think it's that bombardment that gives rise to um, the shifted peak and, and some point defects or, or defect complexes that are involved in the film. Uh, as they raise the pressure, you can see like here's you know, more typical 100 millitor, but still the peak is considerably shifted. A more recent study, this one's from Koinuma's group in, in uh, researchers at uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology. Again, that saw similar things by PLD. The um, strontium titanate substrate in, is in the X-ray diffraction pattern of it shown here. This, their diffractometer is not as fancy. So you see this K alpha one, K alpha two splitting, but the film peak is way over here and it depends um, drastically on the growth conditions. In this case, they were studying not the pressure, but the laser fluence that they used. And so as they changed the fluence, they, this peak was shifting all over the place. They did find a very, it's a very small fluence you can see, but in a, in a very well controlled fluence range, the C axis of the strontium titanate film matched the C axis of the strontium titanate substrate. That would be what zero is here. Whereas at all other fluences, it's extended. And they went a step further, they did it anneal. They annealed this, their films in oxygen. And when they anneal in oxygen, <clears throat> they actually uh, get worse. So the, the extension gets even higher. So it's not just simply uh, oxygen vacancies in this case. Um, third case over here, this is again, strontium titanate on top of a strontium titanate substrate. This is Taiwan Nose Group. Uh, they made uh, metal uh, insulator metal capacitors and saw ferroelectricity. So strontium titanate is uh, not normally a ferroelectric, <laughs> not one unstrained, um, but you can, you can see that they see ferroelectricity. So something, you know, so something definitely happens. Um, so just, you know, just because you have a strontium titanate film doesn't mean that it has uh, intrinsic properties. So good to do control experiments and keep your, keep your eyes open. <clears throat> okay, um, I thought I would, I would also, you know, while I'm talking about it, talk about superconductivity in strontium tightening. Um, and the, the, the groups that have made uh, superconducting strontium titanate, one of them is our, is our moderator, John Mark's group. If you look in, in the depths of the paper, back in the methods section, you'll notice something very interesting. Um, and that is that uh, the temperature, substrate temperatures involved are very high, <laughs> okay? So um, simply making niobium doped strontium titanate at 700 degrees C does not result in superconducting films. Um, but uh, to make these, these films, and these are, made, these are both made by pulse laser deposition, <clears throat> superconduct, very high temperatures are involved. And in going to those high temperatures, not only does superconductivity come in, but also the mobility gets better and the amount of expansion, the, the, the lattice expansion goes down. So this is, these are results from Harold Wong's group. Again, PLD, strontium titanate on top of strontium titanate. And uh, this is the amount of lattice expansion. So how extended the strontium titanate film is compared to the underlying substrate. Uh, it, should be, you know, it should be not extended, it should be at zero. And what uh, Harold Wong's group sees is that as they increase the substrate temperature, that that extension comes down to zero. Um, and at the same time, the electron mobility that they see in the film starts to go up. So all of these things, you know, point to that, that yeah, there can be defects in, in films and, um, and, bum, and, and a way of counteracting those defects is to use thermodynamics, to crank up the temperature and, um, and let the energetics uh, of the lower energy state, uh, state dominate. Okay, so here you can see that, um, that with these high temperatures, superconductivity is, has been done. Um, in, in films of strontium titanate. Uh, the highest electron mobilities that have been seen in films grown by PLD, and these are from Harold Huang's group, are about 6,600. At the same measurement conditions, you can see, I'm gonna compare other techniques. Um, the record in, 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 in the highest mobility of strontium titanate films is 
uh, films grown by Suzanne Stemmer's group uh, at 53,000 mobilities. Um, and that compares to single crystals, which are, are uh, 22,000, okay? And I should point out that even, even an old analysis of mobility from the 60s uh, suggested that point defects were the issue in, in the single crystals, and single crystals also have you know, defects uh, involved in them. And from these um, uh, uh, mobility analysis in the 60s, it was estimated that the intrinsic mobility of strontium, dope strontium titanate should be over a million. Okay, so there's a lot of headroom here, and I just want to want to point out, you know, how um, synthesis does make a difference. Okay, so while I'm, I know I'm gonna, maybe I've gone a little bit over on this on this point, but um, I thought I would I would show uh, various materials that are sensitive to defects. So I've deliberately chosen uh, material, you know, semiconductors with high mobility, uh, a superconductor that is that is extremely sensitive to disorder, and I'm comparing here under the same measurement conditions, the highest figures of merit that have been seen in films made by MBE versus in films that are made by other thin film techniques over here on the right. And um, you can see that the, the, the differences can be dramatic, even though I'm, sh I'm quoting what's the best in the literature. Okay, so you know, uh, zinc oxide, it's two orders of magnitude higher mobility. Um, same thing with Europium titanate. I'll show you that result in just, just, a, just a second. Another two orders of magnitude, you know, go down the list. In superconducting strontium ruthenate, which I won't uh, talk about today, but is a, a material that's very sensitive to disorder, the only reproducible way to make superconducting films of this is by molecular beam epitaxy. Um, and the superconduct, the TCs achieved to date are more than twice as high in nice quantum oscillations in those, in those materials. Okay, list goes on and on. Um, now, I, th I thought that I would, <laughs> uh, I would show, uh, uh, one, one example of the actual data, and this is data where both the records set by MBE and non-MBE are from the same group. They're from Kawasaki Sensei. So, you know, who, who's, whose data, you know, uh, better to show? And Kawasaki has, always has a nice dramatic way of, of making this clear in his publications. So if you look at um, his publications of, of the, the history of the mobility in zinc oxide, <clears throat> His films grown by uh, PLD showed the quantum Hall effect. And so this is a you know, beautiful science paper from uh, 2007. But, but um, realizing the limits of the technique, Kawasaki switched to MBE. And with that, you know, proceeded to increase the mobility by another couple of orders over two orders and more magnitude more, soft fractional quantum Hall, et cetera. Um, on the right-hand side is also results. These uh, results are about a month old, uh, a recent publication from Kawasaki's group, again, using MBE of europium titanate and doping it and comparing it to the best that they could achieve by PLD. Again, uh, uh, so showing that there are um, uh, materials and many of the materials that we're interested in that are very sensitive to defects and you have to always uh, think about the, the synthesis uh, in, that's involved. It's not enough to have you know, a single crystal. Single crystals can have defects in them. Okay, so with, with that um, uh, long answer to the a question that came up last time, let me resume my uh, lecture. And I wanna, I wanna go from talking about this strain engineering uh, concept of using a substrate to impose epitaxial strain, which is a, trick that works well in you know, thin films to uh, epitaxial nanocomposites. So epitaxial nanocomposites go in the third dimension and allow much thicker strained whiskers to be, uh, to be made. So the, uh, the idea here, and uh, this, was, this was first shown by, by Ramesh in the, in the case of these uh, epitaxial oxide composites, um, was here you see a side view and here you see a top view of one of these epitaxial nanocomposites. So under, on the bottom is a single crystal and the, the, uh, the target that Ramesh used, and this was, these were made by PLD, contained both a perovskite and a spinel at the same time. So it was bismuth ferrite and uh, cobalt ferrite. And so all these atoms are being rained down and in a self-organized way, the spinel nucleates and the perovskite nucleates, and they, ep they both epitaxially nucleate with respect to the substrate and epitaxially with respect to each other along their sides, okay? 
And that's what gives rise to the ability to strain a mature, these whiskers for much longer distances. So this, this is a composite where the, one of the materials is, is a whisker and the other one is, in, is an embedding matrix around the whisker. And um, if you have a, you can make this quite thick. Okay, I'll show you in the next slide. So um, this has been shown nicely by Professor um, Judith Driscoll McManus at, at Cambridge in very thick um, epitaxial composites. And here's a, a, a cartoon here on the, on the left, you know, showing the idea, but that unlike the case of a thin film, where if you, you know, just, if you just think about this uh, yellow material here, when you put it on top of the substrate, it experiences this biaxial epitaxial strain, whoops. But uh, then as you start to grow it, the uh, dislocations can come in, the whole film can relax. Whereas if at the same time that you're making this film, you have an epitaxial material that's growing alongside of it, the matrix around this whisker, and that matrix has an epitaxial relation, then the, you can cause the, um, the, the, this, this matrix to strain the whisker to very long lengths, to hundreds of nanometers of, of lengths. And um, uh, here in their nice review, review article, Mc, Professor Mc, McManus and, and Ramesh have shown that this trick is applicable to many systems, you know, including the kind of materials that we're talking about. Uh, to, to, to play this trick though, you need to have a system that does not have, um, have a, that has a miscibility gap. You don't want to have this material dissolving in that material or vice versa. You wanna have a nice pure material that you're straining. Okay, so um, it has some, some limitations. Also to, to get the biggest strains, which, which can be several percent, um, you wanna make the whiskers quite small. And the way that the, the trick that's used to make the whiskers small in this self-assembly um, uh, self technique is to reduce the substrate temperature. So at low substrate temperatures, it's possible to make whiskers that are quite small and achieve strains that are, that are two or three percent. Okay, um, I wanna move to the next uh, trick, um, epitaxial stabilization. Okay, now this is, um, you, can, you can see already the influence of the substrate, hopefully, on the, on the film. And where this trick comes in is when bulk free energies are not on your side, okay? So um, it could be that, um, and it often is, that the, the interesting structure, the structure that you expect to, from based on, on theory or intuition to have you know, possibly great properties um, might be the one that's the metastable structure, okay? So on my, on my energetic uh, landscape here, um, here's the stable structure, okay? So here, you know, Gibbs, free energy is on your side to form this. You can make a nice single crystal of it, but maybe that's a useless material. And really what you'd like is a different polymorph, a different way in which those same atoms are put together, um, but that, that uh, by having the, the, the bonding in a different way, the symmetry in a different way, the distances in a different way, one might get uh, better properties. Okay, so how can you change this? Um, now that's a, that's a difficult uh, thing to do in, in bulk, and it's always good to you know, grow high quality materials quite slowly and have thermodynamics on your side. Um, the trick that's used in thin films is, is not to defy thermodynamics, but it's to change the thermodynamic system from being just the bulk material to the combination of the substrate and the thin film of this material on top of it, okay? So by changing the system from just, you know, a, a, a a beaker full of this or a beaker full of that, where, where in the volume free energy of this wins, by changing the system to involve the substrate, it, and the key thing is the interface with this thin film, you get these additional free energy terms, okay? So if you choose an appropriate substrate, an appropriate substrate is one that um, is not well lattice matched or structurally matched to the, uh, what was the stable phase, okay? So, so you, you deliberately, choose a substrate with the same kind of, uh, of, of uh, structure, the same mosaic, the same pattern as, um, as, as the material that you want to make. And then you rain down the atoms that you want to make and provided that uh, this is thin and that the energy difference, that, that the film that you're making is thin and that the energy difference between these phases is not too large. To give you an idea of how too large is, um, 
energies of the order of 50 to 100 millivolts per atom uh, in, in metastability. So, you know, this, this phase could have an, a, a free energy of 50 to 100 millivolts per atom above that phase, and you stand a chance of being able to epitaxially stabilize it. Okay, so this trick is, uh, is called epitaxial stabilization. It was recognized uh, 40 years ago. So uh, I'll show you uh, by Praveen, Praveen Chaudhry and uh, Mac, Mac Lynn uh, recognized this, this, uh, this ability. You know, they, they wrote out the thermodynamics. Um, and the, here's a quote from, from Praveen, who was uh, um, director of Brookhaven Lab, um, also uh, director of physical sciences at, at IBM when I was a postdoc years ago. Um, but he recognized the, the power of epitaxial stabilization and um, also recognized the importance of the substrate. Now, in, in Praveen's time, there were not many choices of substrates, and that's what severely limited this trick in the past. Um, but because you want to have a substrate that is, you know, has the same structural motif as what you're making, that's the way that you bias the system. So um, it's important if you're trying to use this trick to get the right substrate. So that's where, you know, synthesis people like myself, you know, we travel the world in, in, in well, we used to travel the world <laughs> in, search, in search of the appropriate substrates to use this trick. And so um, uh, yeah, here are, this is actually not a Photoshop uh, picture, but these are, these are some of the largest single crystals in the world, um, up, um, up to 10 meters in dimension, um, just as an, an example of a, of a single crystal. But in, in, in seriousness, in the case of perovskites, there are now uh, a lot of, uh, of different single crystal perovskites, so more than 20 of them with different structural motifs and lattice constants. And uh, this, this group and, and the Institute for Crystal Growth in, in Berlin has, has done phenomenally in terms of making these uh, substrates commercially available in large size and perfection. So, you know, I, I mentioned uh, DISCO, dispersium scandate last time, but there are, there are many in that, in that structural family. Um, a common question that I, I get about um, epitaxial stabilization is, well, how, you know, I already told you in terms of the energetics, how metastable things could be. Well, like, how much pressure does that, does that correspond to? And of course, that, you know, that depends upon the compressibility and the energy scales of things. But I'll show you the, the example that's the highest pressure uh, trick that I, that I know of to date, and that is barium ruthenate. So barium ruthenate, uh, exists in different polymorphs, okay, at atmospheric pressure, it has this rhombohedral polymorph, so-called 9R, uh, where there are nine layers in the, in the unit cell. And as you change the, the pressure, the stable phase, bulk, changes from, um, to, from these other uh, hexagonal phases to eventually, at very high pressures, this is 180,000 atmospheres, it becomes cubic. And here's a nice paper by uh, Professor Goodenough, okay, um, showing that not only uh, can he make this in, in bulk at these high pressures, but the magnetic properties are drastically changed by the angle here, this uh, changing this, this ruthenium oxygen ruthenium uh, angle to 180 degrees, like in this cubic, in this cubic perovskite, makes the material ferromagnetic at uh, 60, 60, 60 Kelvin. Okay, so um, this is uh, an example of where we've been able to use epitaxial stabilization to stabilize this polymorph. So the, you know, the ideal substrate would be something that is cubic at uh, about 3.99 angstroms, where this, this, this phase is. Uh, we don't have a cubic uh, substrate there. So what we used was strontium titanate, okay? So there's a mismatch of about two, two and a half percent, which doesn't help things, but it is possible to make um, up to five unit cells. You can see the, the, the uh, structure change uh, clearly by, by electron refraction. Um, in situ. Also, you can see the, the band structure changed by ARPAs. I'm not going to show you the ARPAs uh, to, today, although, um, but, but it, it does, uh, it is a metal and it can be uh, potassium st uh, stabilized. Um, in, the, in our strain state, a two and a half percent strain on strontium titanate, uh, we do not see ferromagnetism, um, but we are working with our collaborators at the Institute for Crystal Growth to make a larger substrate at around 3.99 angstroms, as you can imagine, to, that's cubic, to bring the right uh, pattern to, to make those 180 degree ruthenium oxygen ruthenium bonds. Okay, so an, an example of epitaxial stabilization. Um, I, sh I also should you know, point out how fortunate we are today where we have you know, some 20 different perovskites compared to just two decades ago. 
So two decades ago, when and Jean Marc will, will will recognize how how you know bleak things were back in high TC uh, cuprate days in terms of in terms of substrates, um, the the number of choices was 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 far lower, and and uh, having these uh, really helps. Uh, with epitaxial stabilization in, in the perovskite space. Now, maybe you're interested in other materials like, uh, you know, rutiles and pyrochlores and spinels, uh, where, again, there's a lack of substrates. So there is one oxide rutile. There is one oxide spinel, uh, commercially available large substrate. But that's a huge opportunity. Darrell, um, Darrell, yes. a short question, just so you, you know you're not alone. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Can you just comment on the quality of these crystals? Because, okay, they look, you know, uh, they're, they're not the same. Huh? Yeah, yeah, okay. Excellent point, Jean-Marc. So, the, um, uh, so even though you have a single crystal, doesn't mean that it's the same quality. And I would say the Cadillac method of making, of growing single crystals is the Tchaikovsky method. Um, and um, I, I learned this, uh, actually the first time I visited this, this institute because we had been making single crystals of, uh, of these scandates uh, in small form in Jochen Monhart's group. My, uh, I was on sabbatical in, in Jochen's group and we made some very small crystals of disco and they were about the you know, size of my finger by the floating zone technique. And, uh, and we, we wanted to have larger crystals that we could, you know, make one centimeter square substrates and use as, as films. So I, uh, you know, we'd spent months making these single crystals and my student and I went to visit this institute and um, Reinhard Ucker over here uh, uh, took me aside and, 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 he, and, he, and he said, you know, those are, those are very nice crystals that you have. Um, but now let me show you how to make a real crystal <laughs> and, um, and proceeded to do so. He used the Tchaikovsky technique. He made crystals that were not only much larger in size, they had far lower defects. So the defect density in terms of dislocations per square centimeter is about 10 to the fourth per square centimeter in, uh, in, in dispersium scandate and gadolinium scandate. Uh, the rocking curve widths are of order 10 arc seconds. So just to put that in, in comparison, if you look at strontium titanate, which is not made by Tchaikovsky, um, strontium titanate, it, it uh, needs a lot of oxygen and it melts higher than platinum. So it, it, nobody's figured out how to make it by, by Tchaikovsky. But um, it typically has a million uh, dislocations per square centimeter and rocking curve widths that are you know, 50 uh, arc seconds in a really good strontium titanate and inhomogeneous. So when you look at this plot, um, most of the materials in this plot are made by Tchaikovsky and have very good perfection. Uh, the exceptions would be strontium titanate, um, which, which is unfortunate because it's such a wonderful material. But uh, this needs very high oxygen pressures, so it's made by this uh, fair, a technique that has huge temperature gradients that gives rise to a lot of defects in it. Um, potassium tantalate is also not made by Tchaikovsky, it's made by top-seeded top -seeded solution growth. Uh, everything else in here is Tchaikovsky and high quality. Thanks, thanks Jean Marc. Okay, um, now not only is it important to have a high quality substrate, but it's important to, if you're, if you're trying to you know, use these epitaxial tricks, to have a surface on that crystal that is not heavily damaged. Okay, so ideally, you know, you'd like, like the surface not to be mechanically damaged by some, you know, by the polishing process, whatever it was. And you'd like it to be atomically smooth. And you'd like to know what the very surface termination layer is so that you can then start to grow your material on top of it. So, you know, perovskites, if you look at the one zero zero direction in this cartoon, they can end with, uh, say, strontium titanate with the TiO2 layer, which, which is what I've colored here gold, or they can end with the strontium oxide layer, which I colored here brown, okay? So um, ideally, if you're, if you're growing on top of this, you not only want it smooth and defect-free and high perfection and large, but you want to know what the surface is, okay? So um, the... Here you can see an actual AFM image of, of what a, uh, uh, a terminated, so uh, an etched, chemically etched and terminated strontium titanate surface looks like. And you can see that you know, over, over microns, there are just a few steps, okay? So you, you might, so, might also want to have it step-free. That's, again, another, another challenge to thermodynamics. Um, but by having a low miscut substrate, you can, and, and annealing it properly, 
You can have a, a long distance between the, the steps, nice wide terraces. Um, and I should point out that the, the, there's a lot of, of science underlying where we are today in, in terms of the substrates. So in the case of strontium titanate, it was uh, uh, Kawasaki sensei who, um, wow, de decades ago, <laughs> uh, uh, showed how HF could be a wonderful etchant to, to make a nice terminated surface of, of strontium titanate. And um, standing upon his shoulders, the, the group at Twente showed how uh, uh, an improvement to that process could give rise to the kind of surface that you see here in this AFM on the, on the right. The, 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 uh, those and other groups have developed recipes for other substrates. And so in terms of the rare earth scan dates, the, the Twente group has shown that, um, that many of the, of the scan dates can be, can be terminated. Uh, lanthanum aluminate can be terminated um, also um, with similar perfection to strontium titanate. I would say that strontium titanate is still the, the model system for, for, for termination. But you know, in terms of synthesis, thinking about these issues is, is very important as well as uh, being able to achieve that. And, um, and, and with that, I wanna point, point to a, a recent uh, development where instead of using acids to terminate a, a substrate and then annealing it in some appropriate conditions, um, uh, Johan Monhardt's group has developed a high temperature substrate heater they're using a CO2 laser that can heat substrates. Uh, well, it's, it's so far it hasn't, hasn't been limited. It's been limited by the melting temperature of the substrate. So, um, so it, can, it can easily go to, to 2000 degrees, degrees C. And, and, with, and with that, um, they have been able to terminate uh, not only the substrates that I just showed you, but even more substrates. So things like uh, magnesium oxide, which, which, which normally has a, you know, it, it, it's, it, forms a hydroxide in humid air, which is problematic. But uh, a, a sapphire all, and, and these scandites, all of these, all of these materials, um, and they show beautiful results. So the, they're, they've found a temperature and oxygen pressure for each one of these materials where they heat to that magic temperature and sit there for about 200 seconds and then quickly cool. And um, here you see the AFM images. That, um, that they can get from these nicely terminated substrates. Again, it's a, it's a smooth surface. It has even better, if you look at the RMS roughness of the, of the surfaces than what's been chemically achieved um, and uh, some additional new materials. Um, so, and also doesn't involve any of the nasty chemistry. So you, you, you put the substrate in, you zap it, and then you're ready to grow on this nice pristine surface. So I, I think this is a very powerful technique to, for, the, for the future. I should also point out that it doesn't, it doesn't seem to work for, every, for everything. So there are some substrate materials <clears throat> where there's a big uh, difference in vapor pressure between the constituents. So an example would be like potassium tantalate, um, where, where the, um, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to, to, terminate, to terminate the uh, material. Um, okay. Now, does, it, does all of this uh, termination actually make a difference? I thought I would show an example of uh, the old days when we used to try to grow um, oxide films on non-terminated strontium titanate. And I'm showing uh, the, the reflection high energy electron diffraction patterns, as well as the time dependence of the intensity of, of, uh, of the specular spot here um, during growth. And what you can see is in the old days, when you started on a fresh substrate, uh, all sorts of strange things were happening, and it took a while to get into a steady state. This is a, a super lattice uh, growing on, on top of it. Whereas if you start with a substrate that has a known termination, so this is strontium titanate using the, the Twente uh, uh, termination of TiO2 terminated, we can then deliberately start with a monolayer of barium oxide, and, uh, and then it, you know, right from the, right the get-go, you see that things look quite good. So you know, it, it definitely helps to have, um, to have these terminations that provide uh, known termination, smooth surface, and low chemical damage. Um, <clears throat> here's the same kind of comparison for dispersium scandate. This is again using the Twente uh, recipe. Um, you can see a drastic improvement compared to you know out of the box, uh, where you know, this has been mechanically or chem mechanically polished. But the the surface, uh, if you look at it by AFM, you don't see any steps. Um, it's a mixture of terminations. It um, it certainly gets much better. It's not as ideal uh, as the strontium titanate case, but, uh, but, but, but much, much better. Okay, so I wanna move next to the, uh, the concept of, of dimensional confinement. 
And this was a method that's been widely used in bulk. Antoine Georges uh, mentioned it uh, last week. In, 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 you know, of course, from bulk is how we learn about a lot of the properties of these materials. And the kind of dimensional confinement he talked about was the, the natural um, super lattices that form in many of these perovskites, <clears throat> the system being the perovskite itself compared to a two-dimensional layered version of it that has the so-called 214 structure. So it's got, um, it's got one of the perovskite layers, but then two of the rock salt layers, whereas a perovskite has one of the perovskite layers and one of the rock salts. So it's like a one-to-one -one super lattice of TiO2 and strontium oxide. Whereas here it would be TiO2, strontium oxide, strontium oxide, TiO2. So let's look at, let's, let's look at this um, from a synthesis perspective in, in thin films. The, the structures are named after the, uh, the original inventors. So, so Ruddleston and Popper uh, discovered the first three members of the series. And that's all that has been made in bulk in single phase form in strontium titanate system. You go to higher, <clears throat> you go to, uh, um, you can imagine, you know, in a cartoon PowerPoint sense, I could imagine just following the same kind of a motif where I have not one perovskite in a row, not two perovskites in a row, not three perovskite rows in a row, but n perovskites in a row. So that gives us n of these perovskites, and then one extra strontium oxide will make this uh, what's called a Ruddleston Popper homologous series. Uh, when n becomes infinity, then you get over to having an equal number of strontium oxides and titanium oxides. That's strontium titanate. Okay. So the dimensionality is obviously changing. This, the, here, the, the coordination polyhedra are connected in three dimensions. If we go all the way over here to the left, they're just sheets uh, in which the coordination polyhedra are connected together. So two dimensions and one can explore intermediate dimensionalities in between. And in many systems, uh, drastic changes in properties occur. So an interesting system are the, are the ruthenates. So over here, a ferromagnetic metal. And when you get over here to strontium-2 ruthenium-04, it's a superconductor. Okay. And, and, and then there's metamagnetic materials at the transition in between. Uh, of course, the iridates, also very interesting. The manganites, the nickelates, you'll be hearing from, uh, from Harold about superconductivity. Um, again, related to these, to, these, uh, to these structures, and you could think of, of taking oxygen out of the structures, again, a chemical trick at low temperature uh, uh, that where you kinetically limit the structure and then suck out uh, oxygen out of the structure. Okay, and, and of course the cuprates, yes. So, so high temperature superconductors, the lanthanum strontium cuprate, lanthanum barium cuprate, it's got this all started, are, are this structure over here on the left. You can think of uh, YBCO as being the N equals two member with some oxygen vacancies in here. Um, so the, the cuprate superconductors also are related to this, the Bettles and Popper phases. Okay, so in, in thin films, um, it's indeed possible to, to use thin film techniques. I'll say a few words about, about the actual synthesis details in a minute, but just to show that it's possible to make these. Um, here's strontium titanate uh, series. This shows N equals one up to N equals five. So if you speak X-ray diffraction, you can see that these are single phase materials. Here's the TEM images. So um, these are grown on strontium titanate substrates. That's what's below the, the arrows here. And then you see up above the arrow that uh, it's got this crystal structure or at the N equals five case, it's got that crystal structure. Um, there are defects in these, in these. There are some vertical running strontium oxide planes. I should point out that in bulk, only the first three members of the series have been made because after that point, um, there's all sorts of intergrowths that, that, uh, that happen. Um, in, in making thin films, the way in which we make these, these structures is to um, start with a single crystal and then in a cartoon sense, deposit you know, a monolayer of strontium and then another monolayer of strontium and then a monolayer of titanium, then a monolayer of strontium, monolayer of strontium, monolayer of titanium, okay. Uh, so in a, in a shuttered way, by sequentially depositing these uh, monolayers, uh, build up the structure. Now that's, that's the cartoon. Um, it's not quite the truth, so I'll, I'll tell you what the truth really is in a few minutes. But um, just to get you thinking about how you might do that in, in thin films, as opposed to bulk, where you try to you know, put it all in a beaker and, and look for some magic temperature and pressure conditions where it's stable. And it turns out that the stability of, say, the N equals four member, um, it's, it's uh, from a, a convex hull, a mixture of the N equals five and the N equals three has just about the same energetics. It's degenerate to the N equals four. So, it, so, it's, uh, so that's why people have not been able to find conditions 
where you can thermodynamically favor this phase, whereas you can uh, layer the material just like you'd build a sandwich. Uh, in the ruthenates, this gets more interesting because there's superconductivity over here on the left and um, ferromagnetism over there on the, on the right. And indeed, uh, you can build up these structures. Now, I, I told you that the cartoon wasn't, wasn't quite right. So I wanted to, to tell you what reality really looks like. And um, the, so on the, on, the, on the left is how we supply the strontium. So this is trying to build one of these high N, N equals six uh, Reynolds and poppers. So the, the, the idea was to make this cartoon structure where there are six perovskites and then an extra layer of strontium oxide and then six more perovskites, extra layer of strontium oxide. The, the timing diagram of the strontium in the, in the uh, in this, these are made by MBE. So we would open the strontium from one monolayer worth of strontium. Okay, but then when we get to the point where we wanna have two monolayers worth, we open it twice as long. Okay, so you can, you know, just layering this thing up. Um, now, when our collaborators uh, went and, and, and we do x-ray on these, look, they look nice, just like I just showed you. But when our collaborators went to, to look at these by electron microscopy, so this is specifically uh, David Muller and Lena Krakutis here at Cornell, they saw this interesting, interesting thing, which we would never expected and, and couldn't see by x-ray. But that is that um, there's something wrong with the structure. Um, and that is that the, the first, from the substrate to the first strontium oxide layer is not six perovskites, but 12, okay? So um, and that, that seemed uh, you know, very strange to, to us. So the first thing we did was we repeated this and uh, with the, with the, with tried the patience of our TEM collaborators, but sure enough, no matter which Reddelson popper we made, so here's an N equals two, uh, there's four unit cells here. And, and uh, N equals three, there's, there's six, okay, there's eight. Okay, so something's definitely happening that's, that's wrong. The first time that we open the extra, add the extra strontium, it doesn't stick. It doesn't, it does not in the, it's not incorporating in the crystal. Okay, so um, uh, it's, to me it was, it was quite, a, quite a shock because we've been making perovskites for, for decades by, by, this, by this point. And um, if I just think of these, of these structures from a more simplistic uh, standpoint, um, for those of you in, in Europe, you know, maybe, maybe uh, you're thinking about, about dinner. <laughs> yeah, a simplistic cartoon of a perovskite is it's, uh, it's basically a sandwich that has a strontium oxide monolayer uh, held between uh, two titanium oxide monolayers. Okay, so I can just think of that as a, as a, as a hamburger. Whereas if you want to think of these, uh, these Ruddleson popper structures over here all the way at the N equals one, it's got, it's got two of those uh, uh, patties. Uh, those strontium oxide layers between the, the uh, titanium titanium oxide uh, layers. So um, you know what I'm what I'm showing here in terms of of, of a crystal structure is well is also um, is not it, it's, it's well it's a bit of a joke but it's um, it is it is uh, if if you if you do go to your local restaurant uh, in fact in Canada they do sell the Ruddleson Popper version of the hamburger um, so you can you know happily order an N equals one uh, version which looks just like just like this. So if I were to, with this, with this cartoon uh, model of, of what really goes on, if I was to say, hey, um, these are the crystal structures that we want to grow, uh, some poppers that range from hamburgers to, to, uh, to this, uh, I forget the name of, <laughs> of it, but the N equals one hamburger version. Um, we're trying to make this from a, a cartoon layering sense. And yet what we end up with from actual growth is we end up with always having the strontium oxide layer on the top, okay? Um, and that's, that's the issue. It's like a surfactant that is, is writing the surface. So to, um, to, to, to see that in spades, we, we again indulged our, our TEM colleagues to look at what happened, happens when we make structures that um, are trying to make uh, a perovskite, okay? Versus putting the strontium oxide layer at various positions. So here I'm gonna show, um, you know, our cartoon of what we, sh of what we shuttered, and versus what actually grows. So indeed, we, we do know how to make uh, hamburgers and um, you shutter this up and it grows exactly the, in, the, in the order that, that we desire, okay? And the, the higher Z element here being strontium in the case of strontium titanate. So um, now let's try to put a strontium, extra strontium oxide in the middle of the stack at this point. And what we see by TEM is, and it's, it's easy to see this by TEM because the Ruddleson popper involves a shift in the plane of a half half offset of the unit cell. So it, when there's a Ruddleson popper defect, the strontium oxides will no longer be lined up in a line like this. There'll, there'll be a jog of a half unit cell. 
you can see that even though we, we, we supplied the growing surface with an extra monolayer of strontium here, it ended up on the top. Okay, um, well, we're seeing that. What happens if you give it three layers of strontium in a row? And the answer is two of them incorporate in the structure and one ends up on the surface. So seeing how the, um, these things really grow and how they liked their, it's energetically favorable to have this monolayer of strontium oxide on the surface, then you can think about uh, how it is that they, they really grow and overcoming that problem. So what we, what, we've, what we saw from our experiments here was if we have a surface that consists of a double strontium and we put titanium on top of it, the titanium uh, uh, goes through the strontium and forms strontium titanate. Okay, so, so it's energetically uh, more stable to have, not have titanium on top of a, a double layer of strontium oxide, but to have a perovskite. Okay, and that's been shown um, from, from first uh, principles calculations, not only in strontium titanate, but in many of the Ruddleson popper uh, series. It's also been seen uh, in situ on the synchrotron. So here is hot strontium titanate being grown by MBE in the same kind of layered cartoon manner. And um, these, uh, these researchers from Argonne National uh, Lab, Dylan Fong, John Freeland's group, were able to see from the, um, uh, there are these, um, Co the, this, this cobra technique, or they're looking at the, at the, at the truncation rods, and they can, they can see signatures of a double strontium oxide layer versus having the titanium on the top. And indeed, they're seeing at temperature that when you put the titanium on top of a double strontium oxide layer, it goes down a monolayer. Um, okay, so when you see that, you think, okay, I, I know now how to, how to solve this problem. To solve the problem, we need to add an extra strontium oxide layer and we could add that extra layer, for example, at the interface when we start, knowing it's not going to, uh, that double layer is not gonna incorporate, it's gonna instead float on the surface. So now when we hit it with, the, with another extra strontium, we can incorporate and form the, the kind of, you know, layerings that, uh, that we desire if you wanna have, you know, full contr control of the structure, okay. And that was kind of long-winded, but I, I just, you know, wanted to point out that there's a lot of synthesis science uh, behind making uh, these interesting Quantum, quantum materials. Um, for those of you that, that don't have lots of cross-sectional TEM or growing on a synchrotron, you can see these changes in electron diffraction during growth. So here I'm, I'm, sh I'm showing electron diffraction patterns um, and I wanna specifically show what happens when you have an extra monolayer of strontium on the surface of your strontium tightening that shows up quite clearly in read as a half order streak, so the position of the arrows. And it can be a double strontium oxide monolayer or even a triple strontium oxide monolayer like this. And what you'll see is a half order streak. If you then hit this with titanium, you see that that streak goes away. So cartoon wise, what's happening, is, and we've established this you know, both post-mortem by the, the, the electron microscopy that I showed you, as well as the argon group has shown this in real time, with, um, with diffraction on the synchrotron during MBE growth. The titanium goes down and you just have one strontium oxide on the surface, that half order goes, uh, reflection goes away. Now, if you have three strontiums in a row and you hit it with titanium, the titanium only goes down one. And you can see that from electron diffraction. Uh, we can also see it in TEM, I just showed you the TEM, but in electron diffraction, you can also see it because if the titanium had gone down two, there would be two strontium oxides on the surface which would give you a half order. Instead, it only goes down one and you have no half order, okay? So, you know, seeing how materials really grow then allows you to control them and, and, uh, and get the kind of heterostructure that you desire. Ah, so I showed you examples of uh, up to N equals five. Um, I always, I thought it'd be fun to, to throw in some, some uh, recent results. So, here I show uh, what the, the, the record is. Um, the record that's published is N equals 10. Okay, this is again in the strontium titanate uh, system. So here you see the, the, the X-ray diffraction as well as the, as the TEM showing these, these blocks. I put the unit cell here, but these are 10 perovskite layers, which are between this white line and that white line. Um, the record that's unpublished, we just submitted this, is 20. So, um, and I should point out that this inc requires incredible control of, of fluxes. If you think of this just from a perovskite standpoint, 
the fact that every 20 unit cells you've added one extra strontium means that you're you know, just a couple of percent off in composition. So to, to make it so that you have 20 unit cells, which is the unit cell that I'm showing over here, um, this is 20 unit cells from, 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 uh, from here to here. And you can, here you can see in, in, you know, from diffraction that it's very clearly uh, ordered. So yes, it is possible to make these, uh, these Ruddleson poppers uh, controllably. Darrell? Um, yes. Darrell, uh, since we're discuss discussing termination, there is a question of Gal Tuvia. Uh, Gal, you want to ask your question to Darrell? Uh, yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi. So, yes, I can hear you. Uh, since yeah. you so you mentioned this uh, strontium oxide layer in the STO moving to the top, regardless of uh, uh, when you deposited it. So there was this uh, uh, paper uh, published two years ago on uh, STO LAO where they show that regardless of if the STO is TIO2 or SRO terminated, the lanthanum aluminate termination layer is always uh, aluminum dioxide, not. Uh, I kind of lost you. Oxide. I kind of so lost you. See, it, it sounds. Hello? Yeah. yeah, okay. Ah, sorry, sorry. So wh when did you lose me? <laughs> yeah, I missed part of your question. Um, okay, so I'll just ask it again quickly. Please. So. Yeah, so in the STO, they looked into the STO LAO interface and they saw that regardless of if you terminate the STO with a TIO2 or a SRO, they got uh, aluminum dioxide termination in the LAO. So uh -huh. it, it sounds very, very similar to what you are showing here, where you put this uh, layer and it uh, always bubbles up to the surface somehow. Okay. So, okay, I think, yeah. I, I think I got the. Now, um, I should be a little bit. What I'm talking about is having an extra monolayer of strontium oxide. If you have an extra strontium monolayer of strontium oxide, it likes to be on the surface. If you're just making a perovskite, like say, you know, this, this thing here, if I take this and I put titanium on, on, on top of it, it's going to sit on top of it. So what, 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 we see, what we see by MBE is, well, I should, maybe I should be a little more careful. Um, so, you know, what I'm talking about is making Ruddleson poppers where you have an extra strontium oxide layer, where there's a double layer somewhere. And I think that what, you, what you've been talking about in, uh, with LAO-STO is it's an all perovskite system. So it's not like you deliberately have an extra monolayer of the rock salt phase. Yeah. So here I'm talking about having a system with an extra monolayer of the rock salt and how to control that extra monolayer. Maybe I didn't really answer your question, but uh, the, 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 I guess the common, and, and these things are com complicated, um, but the thing I, I wanna say is the simple cartoon um, is, can, can, can lead you in the right direction, but it's not necessarily what's really going on. <laughs> okay, so, so, um, so it's it's good to 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 actually have follow up measurements of what's uh, what's really going on. It it also shows that that you really need to look very carefully with TM and other techniques to really understand you know how to get these very complicated materials. We have to say. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. If you just made a structure and believed the cartoon, and then inferred all sorts of things from transport without actually interrogating what the interface is. You could you could be misled in many ways. <laughs> yeah, thank thank you, Jean-Marc. Yeah, okay. I think uh, I I get the picture. It's a uh, sort of a different system. And uh, thank you. Okay, so I want to um, move on now to interface engineering. This is um, you know thin films are very good at making heterostructures that contain multiple multiple different layers. And in oxides are no exception to this of so the excitement that can be can be found here. Um, and one one example I thought I'd start with would be a strontium ruthenate, strontium titanate super lattice, where let's just push it push it to the to the maximum. Let's try to push the strontium ruthenate layer to be just one unit cell thick. So um, you know from a from a shuttering cartoon perspective, this is what we tried tried to grow. 
uh, by electron microscopy, this is a high angle annular dark field image. Um, you might argue with me uh, whether that's one monolayer or three monolayers thick. You can certainly see it's a little bit brighter here and ruthenium has a higher Z than titanium. But using uh, spectroscopy, uh, our, our collaborator, uh, uh, David Muller, can identify where the ruthenium's are. And you can see, at least in the small field of view, that uh, there's one monolayer of ruthenium and then five monolayers of titanium. So this is a map of uh, you know, looking column by column of where the titaniums are versus the ruthenium's uh, spectroscopically using electron energy loss spectroscopy. And those same kind of maps are doable, not just in the ruthenates, but uh, here's an example in, in the manganites of trying to make uh, interfaces between strontium manganite and lanthanum manganite, another very interesting uh, uh, system. So where you have uh, two antiferromagnets com coming together to make a conducting ferromagnet at their, at their interface. And uh, David Muller is, is able not only to do that on a small scale, but even on a large scale. You can have chemical analysis of these, of these interfaces. And that ability um, allows you from a synthesis perspective to also look at the reality, you know, instead, of, instead of a zoomed in region like this, to look at the reality and see that there are regions that are two unit cells thick here of manganese, but there are also regions that have three unit cells thick. So there, there are, you know, there are steps and little islands and those can be correlated with each other. So it's, it's very useful to be able to see, you know, what kind of interfaces are really being, are being made. And, you know, real films and crystals do have steps and, and defects um, in them. Here's the, tit the titanium from the strontium titanate substrate. Okay. Um, now let's look a little bit broad, more broadly and then think about the properties that this, that this has. Um, so, so in the strontium titanate case, here's a, a broader uh, TEM image. And I show that again because you can see that there are some regions where there is, on, on average, we, we controlled our, our flux correctly, but there are regions where we have a little bit uh, less than, than a monolayer. And there's a region here where we have a little bit more than a monolayer. Um, at, at, at that uh, position. Now let's look, at the, let's look at the transport properties. A lot of uh, people have made thin films of strontium ruthenate and thin film super lattices of strontium ruthenate to look at how dimensionality affects uh, strontium ruthenate. And there've been also a lot of first principles uh, calculations of what the effect of dimensionality should be on strontium ruthenate. And the results and the predictions are all over the place. So um, I'll, I'll weigh into this quagmire um, just by showing some experimental results. And um, our experimental results are that at one monolayer, so this is one monolayer separated by five uh, unit cells of, of strontium titanate, that the films are metallic, and I'll show you in just a second, but they're also, they're also ferromagnetic. So, um, and I uh, am overlapping this with data from other leading groups uh, showing not one monolayer, but well, this is one monolayer and five, five, uh, one monolayer of strontium ruthenate. So this is you know one RuO2 and then five TiO2s. Uh, what what we see is much different. What we see is you know and even down to low temperature, this still has you know it, it it's it's quite conductive, and um, and magnetic, and I think this is an example again where you have to 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 think about um, what could be happening in terms of synthesis. So the magnetic measurements you see here, um, clear observations of, of magnetism. Um, this 0.3 bore magnetons per, per ruthenium, looks like it's, it's broken up into domains. Uh, very interesting and, and different than what, um, what others have seen. I would um, point out the difficulty in making strontium ruthenate. So if I, again, come back to this table that I showed earlier, and if I compare the very best strontium ruthenate that's been made by MBE, and the, the method of comparison that I'm using is the residual resistivity ratio of how, how a measure of disorder, how, how much the resistance or resistivity changes from room temperature to, to low temperature. And in our MBE films, this changes by um, over two orders of magnitude, whereas the very best uh, films that have been made by non-MBE techniques, these are made by pulse laser deposition here, have uh, a factor of 14. If I put them side by side, this is the best that's been published for um, a PLD grown strontium ruthenate film. And uh, you, can, you, know, you can see it clearly, it's, it's, it's ferromagnetic, but if you compare the residual resistivity here, um, these, and here I'm, I'm showing a 10 Kelvin 
uh, comparison, so we're comparing apples, apples to apples. The, um, if we go to, down to, to uh, 4 Kelvin, this number becomes more than 250. Uh, the amount of disorder that's present in these films is, is far lower. And I think that's what's beyond what we're seeing here um, and behind, behind this controversy, that uh, the transport properties of strontium ruthenate are very sensitive to ruthenium vacancies. Ruthenium oxide is very volatile at the high temperatures that are used to make these structures. And when you go to thin films, you need to be concerned about ruthenium loss. And in, in uh, the way that we, we grow these films, we deliberately flood with excess ruthenium, so-called absorption controlled uh, regime, just like growing gallium arsenide, where we flood to uh, reduce the ruthenium vacancies. And that's how we were able to make reproducible superconducting films of strontium ruthenate. I think that's also what gives rise to the intrinsic properties here of this conductive uh, ferromagnetic state in monolayer thin strontium ruthenate. Um, I should go a step further to say that uh, uh, Bernhard Keimer's group at uh, Max Planck in Stuttgart has looked at films by Raman spectroscopy and can, has identified peaks that correlate quite well with the amount of uh, semiconducting behavior or non-superconducting behavior in the strontium ruthenate 214. Um, and can also see that it also the, the, Raman, the Raman signature picks up um, in, as the films become more and more insulating. So we think what's going on there is that the Raman is showing uh, evidence of the ruthenium vacancies that are, that are in the films. And as you get rid of those vacancies, you can start to see the intrinsic properties. Okay. Uh, ah, okay. Another, another uh, super lattice. So this is, um, this is a super lattice in strontium titanate, lead titanate. And this is from Ramesh's group. And I, I show this be, because of the incredible properties that can come, come about at interfaces. So a, 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 the, a minute ago, we were looking you know, structurally at the high angle annual dark field TEM, but if Ramesh just goes in and maps the direction of the polarization uh, by looking at how far the titanium is offset in the, in the unit cell, what he sees is that the, the, uh, the, the, the polarization of this normally ferroelectric layer, where the, the polarization would be always parallel and going out of plane, has turned into these polarization vortices. Um, so so uh, here, you, well, here you clearly clearly see it. And not only are there vortices, but the vortices uh, alternate in their, in their direction um, in the this, in this state. So here's a, you know, a cartoon on the right and real data here on the left showing these, these uh, polarization vortices and how they're long tubes. Um, by Phase field simulations, uh, Long Chen's colla uh, uh, Ramesh's collaborator, Long Chen at Penn State, was able to calculate the expected effect of strain on these super lattices of strontium titanate and, and, and lead titanate, and um, uh, came up with this map here. I put, I put substrates here on, on, on top of that. The previous example that I showed you was on DISCO over here, uh, where it was in the so called vortex state. But um, Long Chen's calculation suggested that by changing that strain state of the entire super lattice, one might be able to see the polarization equivalent of a magnetic skirmion. So instead of having magnetizations that are, that, are, that are forming this topological structure, it would be polarizations that are forming this topological structure. And indeed, in this uh, re recent uh, paper, Ramesh's group has shown that these super lattices now in a different strain state by putting the whole thing on strontium titanate do indeed show polarization skirmions. Um, and I'm, I'm going to show a, a, a cartoon just to, to, um, uh, to, to show you know, what's going on here with this very unusual topology of the, of the polarization. So I'm not sure if the video rate is, is fast enough, but you can, um, you can see from at least from the, the combined phase field and first principles calculations that the state that's involved in these, uh, in these super lattices is, is indeed uh, much different than what you find in, in bulk in either of these materials. So the excitement of putting together uh, super lattices to change, to change properties. I've spoken a lot about perovskites. I wanted to say that the same idea of, of making super lattices also um, works in non-perovskite systems. So here's an, here's an example of a super lattice in rutile. This is a titanium oxide substrate with iridium oxide, titanium oxide super lattice on top of it. You can clearly see the iridium oxide. That's the bright high Z, high Z material. 
So um, another example would be of, of you know, like, again, this interface uh, engineering uh, in pyrochlores. So pyrochlores are a very interesting system, for, especially in quantum materials and spin ices and quantum spin ices and while semi-metals. Um, unfortunately, there have not been any commercial substrates with the pyrochlore structure, but um, our collaborators at the Institute Crystal for Crystal Growth are, have started making uh, pyrochlore substrates, nice single crystals. Um, this one's grown by Tchaikovsky. And if you have a nice substrate, you can make a nice film on top. Uh, here you can see again the same kind of you know the same kind of expectations you have of of, um, uh, of playing the same kind of, of of games and having abrupt interfaces and strain engineering. Okay, um, I'm moving a little bit a little bit more 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 quickly through these these tricks. I, I want to come next to uh, one that has been mentioned uh, multiple times. So I'm gonna spend the least amount of time talking about it. In fact, there was a question on, on it about the uh, lanthanum aluminate strontium titanate. The concept of bringing together materials that have um, conflicting order parameters and letting them duke it out at the interface and how that can give rise to very interesting uh, states at that interface, um, whether it's a two-dimensional uh, electron gas or electron liquid, uh, ferromagnetism at the interface between materials that are antiferromagnetic, uh, spin polarized effects, etc. Et, et, et um, but I'm going to skip that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because I want to spend my uh, uh, my last of my time talking about this last trick of uh, of breaking symmetries. So the uh, the concept of breaking of breaking symmetry is the maybe the at least the, the, the newest and perhaps the least uh, perfected, but I wanted to, to show you to get you thinking about how another way of, of tweaking a material. And the, the concept here um, was, was one that we developed to make a new room temperature multiferroic. So um, it is a, a, like Antoine pointed out, it's is a, a, a quantum material. Um, and if I asked you, to, you know, today, what's the, the, the room temperature multiferroic, there's, there's really only one in which you can electrically uh, control magnetism, and that is bismuth ferrite. Um, uh, there are more that are predicted, there are more that have actually been synthesized, but they all leak so much that you can't electrically affect magnetism. So uh, bismuth ferrite is a fantastic ferroelectric, um, but when it comes to the magnetism, it's a very weak uh, ferromagnet. Okay, and you can see that from its very low uh, uh, moment, moment here. So this trick that I'm gonna, gonna show you is a way of making a, uh, of breaking the symmetry of a material that normally is not ferroelectric, but is ferrimagnetic. And by breaking its symmetry, it becomes both ferroelectric and ferrimagnetic at the same time at room temperature. Now that, that trick comes about uh, if, if we sort of look under the hood at not the stable ground state of this material, and this material I'm, I'm talking about is lutetium ferrite with a one to two uh, ratio. So it's a mixture of iron two pluses and iron three pluses. Um, and uh, okay, so if we, if, but if we look in the, in the computer of what the stable ground state of this material is, um, it's got charge ordering, okay. Um, it's very magnetic, robust magnetism here but it's got a mirror plane that's perpendicular to the C axis and that destroys the uh, in, in inversion symmetry. Uh, it, allow, it allows inversion symmetry, yeah, which, which destroys ferroelectricity. So this, this um, but close by in energy, at least, at least from these uh, first principle calculations done by Craig Feeney, are a bunch of different metastable polymorphs. And I've, I've grouped them to some be above the number line here, all the ones that are centrosymmetric. Uh, all the ones that are not ferroelectric, and below the, the number line. The ones below the number line all lack inversion symmetry. They all have a spontaneous polarization on the computer. Um, and the energy difference between these different ground states of lutetium ferrite is very small. So millivolts, so this is, this is uh, you know, um, the air bars of the measure of the calculation are more than the four millivolts per four million unit here. So from, a, you know, from an epitaxial stabilization standpoint, uh, these things could become 
uh, of interest, particularly when you look at the properties here. This one's predicted to have higher ferry magnetic uh, and at the same time that it's broken the, the, uh, the mirror symmetry. So you can, these are the lutetium atoms here. And here there are two lutetiums up and one lutetium down, but that gives rise to, because lutetium is charged, to an overall polarization that would be in the up direction. So this, this, you know, if this could be realized, uh, one could take a ferry magnet that's not ferroelectric and make it a multiferroic. Okay, so that, so that becomes the, the goal. Um, when you see this, you go, well, how, how is it that I can break the symmetry of this material? And, uh, and maybe the obvious thing to use is epitaxy. Epitaxy on a material that has a motif that looks like the one that, you, that we desire. Okay, and let me, let me point that out now. I'll, I'll, um, in, 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 here was the structure of the material that I've been talking about up to now, lutetium iron 204. Um, you, can, you can see, and this, this is actual TEM data on the right. Um, the only uh, artist part of it is that the, the, um, the irons have been colored, okay, just to make it clear what's going on in the structure. So here, these, these irons, which would, would normally just be faint, they are now have been colored uh, to be, to be uh, faint red, <laughs> okay, uh, to show that there are, there are two iron oxide layers here, but, and then a lutetium oxide layer, the bright thing, I see. Now that's the structure I've been talking about. You can see how you know, the experimental data shows quite clearly that these, these lutetium layers are flat. Uh, and let me contrast that to a well-known epitaxially stabilized ferroelectric material on the right here, where the lutetium layers are not flat, they're puckered. They have just two up, one down kind of structure that hopefully you can see with my, with my cursor. Um, and it's a, very, it's a very similar structure except that it has one iron oxide instead of having two iron oxides, okay? So here we've colored the, um, the irons blue, okay? But this is real TEM data and all that's been done is the, 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 the white has been replaced with blue in the, in the, in the iron part. Um, and I wanted to emphasize these two very close structures. They're, they're, sim they're similar, they're both hexagonal. They have similar lattice constants in plane. Um, they both have these trigonal bipyramids. Now I say that because when you look at it, you might think that's an octahedron, but it's not an octahedron. This iron is surrounded by three oxygens in plane and two apical oxygens. So it has five neighboring oxygens around that, uh, around that iron, whereas in an octahedron you have six. Okay. But anyway, these are very similar structures. And uh, the way to break the symmetry is to start with a film of this and put on top of it a film of this, which is what you see over here on the right. So over here on the right, notice that the, the, this, this first film has this puckering, okay? Because it's just one lutetium oxide. Um, but then when we switch from, from one monolayer of iron oxide to two monolayers of iron oxide, you can see that both in the bottom here and in the top, whoops. The puckering of the lutetiums remains. Here it was flat next to the double irons. Here it's puckered, okay? Which is exactly what we want in the structure. We want the lutetium to be puckered right next to the double iron oxide. That's the ground state that should be simultaneously ferry magnetic and ferroelectric at the same time. Here you see it in TEM. I wanna show it to you in terms of, in terms of properties. This will be, I'm, I'm very close, uh, Jean-Marc, to running out of time. <laughs> uh, but here's the, here's the two structures that we uh, put together. And uh, Julia Mundy, who, who um, along with Charles Brooks, did all the, all the growth that you see here, um, uh, looked at the properties and found that the, the magnetic transition temperature was highest when there were nine of these uh, 113 lutetium ferrites followed by one of the 124s. So a way of breaking symmetry to make the material simultaneously uh, ferroelectric and ferromagnetic at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, in that... Um, now, can I ask you something? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm alone, but since Mark gave sure. me control. <laughs> no, if you go one more slide back. Uh, yeah, here, if I'm looking at the uh, double red layer. Yeah. On the top, and I'm looking above, I see two up, one down. Yeah. But if I'm looking below, I, I see two down, one up. You're right on. There's a domain wall right there. But, but if you, and if but you look down here, electric. 
If you look, it, ex, it exactly. So if you look, there are domain walls vertically in the structure and they lie here and they also lie in the, in the middle of this part. Here, if you look at the top of this block, it's two down, one up. Mm -hmm. And here it's two up, one down. Oh, I see, okay, okay. So there's a domain wall here and there's a domain wall there. And um, yeah, I didn't, put, I didn't put it in the talk, but um, Megan has mapped 200,000 columns now in these structures to map out the domain wall distribution and look at the statistics, okay? So, so um, you, you, you were totally right. There are domain walls in this material. Uh, we do see electrical control of magnetization, but it's a very interesting um, uh, domain wall uh, <laughs> issue. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I didn't, I didn't bring the backup slide, John Mark, but I'll, 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 um, I'll email you, it's on the archive. I'll email you, I think, I think you might. No problem. Okay. Okay, so um, I, think I'm, I think I've used up my time, John Mark, is that uh, all right? If, is it time for questions or shall I, shall I, can, I have some more, okay, I'll, I'll go a little bit further. Um, I've talked about these epitaxial tricks. I wanted to, to end with uh, giving you an idea of what epitaxy really looks like on the atomic basis, okay? So, you know, I've talked about it with various cartoons and, you know, how we can rain down atoms and we call it epitaxial if the atoms that uh, are on the surface inherit their structure from what's underneath them. So the epi, the film or the surface, is getting its shape, the taxi from the, from the substrate. All of these are examples of, of, of epitaxy. Um, here are also epitaxial examples, you know, different substrates, crazy materials, like we've been talking about. Now, what is this, what is this um, how does growth really, really happen? And so I, I thought I would first show you textbook, and then I would um, talk about uh, reality by showing you some uh, low energy electron microscope movies during epitaxial film growth. And this will be short. Okay. Uh, but I think this, just from a synthesis perspective, it, it helps build the, the picture. So um, in, in, in introducing, you know, terminated substrates, I talked about steps. One way in which crystal growth can occur is when you rain down the atoms on top of the, on top of the substrate, they can, uh, they can add to the step edge here. It's a low energy uh, place to add. You don't, instead of nucleating some new layer, which is going to cost you more dangling bonds, you can just add to this. And another place to add would be, would be over here. Um, this kind of a growth mode is called step propagation. So you, you rain down atoms. What you would see from the top would be these, a train of steps moving across the, the, the substrate as more and more atoms are, are added. Okay. Um, here's a cartoon of that, of that happening where you know, the, the atoms are these little boxes getting added to the, to the steps. You can in fact see this with electron diffraction. If you have a constant um, surface density of steps, you see no change in the, the intensity of the diffracted, uh, of, the, of the scattered uh, read intensity. Whereas if you have a changing step density, like you would get if you were nucleating more step edges, say here in the middle of this terrace, then that would cause the intensity to decrease until you've filled in this terrace, then it comes back high again. Okay. So you can, you can see that. Um, here's another example, both uh, heteroepitaxy as well as homoepitaxy, of how it's possible to make rough surfaces. Okay, often something we don't want. But here, homoepitaxially, this is, this is a uh, STM image, looking at the, the islands of gallium arsenide that are making a mound, okay? Um, so even in homoepitaxy, if you have the wrong growth conditions, you can make mounds. Uh, in heteroepitaxy, you can also make mounds with the wrong growth conditions. So this is clearly higher than, than, than the one that's underneath it. Uh, another way that think, things can grow, so I've you know, talked about island growth, I've talked about step flow. Another one is, is what can happen if you have um, uh, screw dislocations. This was uh, beautifully predicted by, by, by uh, Sir Charles Frank in, um, 70 years ago, okay, and um, observed in many materials. Actually, it was observed uh, before his prediction. Um, 
but uh, here in, in high TC coop rates, for example, it's they, they, uh, they, 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 they grow by this mechanism. Okay, now with that as a preamble, let's look and see how a homoepitaxial film of platinum grows. Okay, so a very simple system. So there's not any, you know, wacky oxide, um, just simple platinum on top of platinum, what can be easier. And the movies that I'm gonna, gonna show you come from Michael Altman at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. I have three different movies from, from Michael and I wanna thank him for, for providing them. So the field of view here is uh, about 10 microns across this, this low energy electron microscope. And when I start the video, what you're gonna see is the existing surface steps on this single crystal of platinum, and then platinum is getting added to it. And Leem has very, has excellent a, a vertical resolution. So you, you, you'll see, uh, okay, let's start the movie, we'll, we'll see it. So these steps that you see here are all one atomic layer high, but as platinum is being added, you can see the steps are moving. There's step flow going on. And if you, I'll play the movie one more time. If you, if you watch carefully, you'd see that in addition to the step flow, there's also spiral growth happening around this screw dislocation here, okay? So we, you can clearly see it's not just a drift of the image, but uh, there is actual crystal growth happening by step flow and spiral growth. Okay, so that was, that was example one. Let's now move to another example, a more homoepitaxy. This time it's gonna be silicon on silicon with some antimony doping, okay? And you can, here you see the starting steps on the surface. You say, aha, there's a, there's a dislocation there. A screw dislocation has intersected the surface. Something interesting might happen there. Okay, more steps. Let's now start the, the movie and, and look at the, the growth that's gonna proceed. Here you can see that there are some nucleation of, of steps, so, and step flow, and spiral growth, all at the same time, <laughs> okay? So I'll play it, I'll play it one more time, but I, I, to me, again, a, a beautiful, um, there's also some step pinning going on here. So you can see the step has, has meandered, maybe there's some, some, some defect that's in, in, in inhibiting the, the growth front. So I'll play it, play it again. You can see the nucleation of just a, 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 a some people call this birth and spread, but it's a one monolayer thick island that has formed on top of the terrace, in addition to having the step flow and the spiral growth. Okay, and you can see that, notice how, how, how the, the, the steps are not completely straight. They're often pinned and that can be pinned by some sort of a defect on the surface. Okay, now with, with those you know, more textbook examples, uh, let me end, and I really will end this time, with a, um, a heteroepitaxial one that you know, I think would be hard to, uh, to ever guess of what's gonna happen. So let's, let's um, maybe, here we go. Okay, so silver on iron at room temperature. Again, I'm not showing any, any oxides. This might get you thinking about uh, lime of oxides, which I think would be terribly useful to see the actual growth. And here, in this case, you can see that there are some steps on the surface, but in terms of how this grows, um, it is none of the growth modes that I've, uh, I've, that I've introduced. And that shows the real power of looking more deeply and going deeper than the cartoon of seeing what really happens in synthesis. So with that, Jean-Marc, my lectures, are uh, done and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dial. Thank you very much for this uh, beautiful uh, presentation and for sharing with us these amazing movies, really beautiful. I can uh, take the credit, that's Michael Altman. No, no, I don't <laughs> <put that>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, we move now to uh, questions and uh, answers and uh, maybe to, uh, Maybe I, I would like first to go back to your first lecture. Uh, yeah. There were two questions uh, that were asked. And um, the first one is from Yorick, but I don't think he's with us today. But since everyone saw these questions, I think it would be good still to, to answer those. So the first one is, uh, we're back now to uh, European titanate. Uh -huh. And the question is, um, you know, you have europium titan, titanate with europium 2 plus titanium 4 plus. And the question is, why does europium need 
to be two plus cannot you get europium three plus and titanium three plus uh, yeah exactly and it forms a different structure and that structure is called a uh, pyrochlor <laughs> <laughs> ah oh no actually okay um okay let me come, come back to the question okay okay so i mean i i missed the subtlety of the question um the the uh he wants to conserve oxygen okay i i, I gave an answer so that would be adding oxygen to the system. Okay, so the, the question is, why is europium two plus titanium four plus more stable than titanium three plus europium three plus? Yeah, that okay. is the question, I guess, yeah. Okay, and my answer would be simply thermodynamics. Okay, <laughs> so you, <laughs> you always, you know, whether you wanna call them a half cell reaction from a battery or you wanna make an Ellingham diagram, um, you need to, 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 to look at the uh the stability of the oxidation of the species okay so as a function of the oxygen chemical potential one enters the europium two plus titanium four plus regime before one oxidizes the um europium to three plus now that said it is very easy to oxidize the europium to three plus okay and furthermore um, at even higher oxygen chemical potentials, it's easy to oxidize the titanium to four plus. <laughs> so if you, if you look as a function of oxygen chemical potential, you'll see that there is this uh, perovskite europium two plus titanium four plus, and then you get to, uh, and, and there's the concept of oxygen vacancies. We've talked some, some about that. So it's possible to have, have those defects. Um, but, then, but then as you increase the oxygen chemical potential, you get to the regime of having europium three plus with titanium four plus, and that forms in the pyrochlor structure. Okay, maybe a long-winded uh, answer to your okay. question. <laughs> and still um, talking about your uh, presentation of um, your um, previous pre presentation, we're back to uh, ruthenium oxide. Uh, yes. Which yes. is superconducting. This is really very yeah. exciting. Yes. And uh, we got this question from Igor, who I think also is not with us today. Um, he's asking if you've uh, performed uh, measurements in magnetic field. And did you try uh, using something else instead of ruthenium to see if there is an isotopic effect? Awesome. Okay, great. <laughs> great questions, Igor. Um, so the answer to the first one is yes. And the answer to the second one is no. So let me... Um, <laughs> Can you see, oh, I need to share my screen, that's it. Okay, sorry, just a second. Uh, I need to pull up a backup slide. Hopefully I have it in the talk. Wow, check it out. Okay, um, I'll just answer it in words then, Jean-Marc. So the, um, we, we, we did indeed uh, measure the critical current and also apply a magnetic field. And uh, we see that it's, it's robust superconductivity. Uh, we can, by applying a magnetic field uh, while measuring the transport, we can completely quench the superconductivity. Uh, the critical current is about 10 to the fourth amps per square centimeter. So for a, uh, a simple metal superconductor, it's not, because I mean, it's, it's a great question because you're, again, you're looking for a dirt effect. Is this, um, you know, not due to the majority of the sample that we see by diffraction and by TEM, but by some sort of an interface thing that's going on or some, some sort of a dirt effect. So we wanted to, to see, you know, is this robustly superconductivity? Now, in terms of isotopes, we have not done any um, isotope uh, experiments. Um, uh, we have done extensive ARPAs. So I showed you, I showed you some of the ARPAs. If you look on our um, archive paper, you'll see a lot more, a lot more ARPAs um, along different cuts, comparing it to, to, uh, to, to the band structure. Mm -hmm. um, and I, if I was to be bold, um, I would say that my hope is that uh, this is just the beginning of um, using epitaxial tricks to make new superconductors, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm, I'm adding to these questions uh, uh, another one. I mean, when you uh, are, were you looking for superconductivity with this ruthenium oxide? No. Okay. No. <laughs> no. The, the um, a, a great question. So I, I would, um, I, yeah. So so Jacob Ruff, the first author on the on the archive uh, paper, is the one that that found this, and um, Jacob. Uh, started by doing ARPAs. So Jacob, Jacob was doing lots of, diff, lots of ARPAs. And um, Jacob also did a lot of the first principles calculations. And he was trying to reconcile the ARPAs that he was seeing to the first principle calculations that he was seeing. And um, Jacob is of the belief that any Fermi liquid can potentially, uh, will become superconducting at some temperature. Uh, and what he saw from the ARPAs was that the, 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 um, Density of states seemed to be closer to the Fermi level than he would expect. And he looked, so, so I should point out, okay, the ARPA setup that, uh, that my collaborator Kyle Shen has built goes to a temperature of about 10 Kelvin. This thing superconducts at two Kelvin, mm -hmm. okay? So Jacob, Jacob's seeing, you know, he's looking at the band structure and he's looking at the effect of strain. And then he gets the idea that maybe he should take the sample to lower temperature. Mm -hmm. And um, for us, that's, that's, that's hard because within the, within the group, we can easily go to four Kelvin, but going lower is, is hard. Yeah, uh, but I, I, I noticed that you went down to, to dilution temperature. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> that is correct. That is correct, Sean. Yeah. Um, but, but totally the, the credit goes to an observant graduate student trying to reconcile what's going on and gee, doesn't this look like it might be closer to superconductivity? <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't an accident in the sense that you know um, suddenly put put the sample in the dipper and see superconductivity. It was there was a lot of thought that that uh, that went into to Jacob wanting to do the dilution fridge uh, experiment. Okay, thank you very much. So we move now to to uh, your um, to this lecture, and first we have a question uh, regarding uh, terminations uh, coming from Ruby. So, Ruby, uh, can you ask your question, please? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can, uh, Ruby. Okay. Thank you all for a wonderful lecture, and it was really nice. So, I have a quick question regarding potassium tantalate. So, can we do the, the termination for potassium tantalate same as strontium titanate? Okay. So, yeah, potassium tantalate is, um, there is a, a published recipe for potassium tantalate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in Niha's, Niha's paper. Yeah. So there's a recent paper by, um, let me see if I can do this. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, I guess there are, the, potassium tantalate is hard to terminate, okay. So there was a termination recipe that involved just annealing that uh, just furnace annealing. Oh, okay. But so, um, it's been perfected. Well, okay, I'll show you the paper. I'll show you the paper and I'll try to show you the paper. <laughs> if I'm good at Zoom, I'll be able to show you the paper. Let's try this. Can you see this paper? Uh, yes, I can see the paper. Okay, so um, this this group maybe, uh, this group has has the best uh, termination recipe I'm aware of for potassium tantalate, and um, they've used it to to make it a, a spin polarized two dag at the at that interface. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Sure. Okay. It, inv it involves. I mean, the the difficulty is you want to heat this thing up. Um, to, to, uh, to help terminate the surface, but the potassium is volatile. And so the, um, the, the trick is to have the right amount of potassium overpressure. You might think of having, um, surrounding it with, with potassium oxide powder, okay? But the vapor pressure of potassium oxide over potassium oxide powder is different than the vapor pressure of potassium over potassium tantalate crystal. So what this group did, cleverly, was they took two substrates and they put them face to face a small distance apart in the furnace. 
Um, and they heated that up and they found a controlled temperature region where they could keep the surface from going potassium poor, which is what happened if you just heat it up and, and have nothing, no extra potassium source around, you'll get a potassium deficient surface that is bad. <laughs> okay, whereas you want a flat, a flat stoichiometric surface. Yeah, maybe a little bit long-winded, but uh, this, is, this is the place to, to look for the best, the best that I'm aware of so far. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Darrell. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Andy, who first is uh, saying, uh, wonderful talk, <laughs> Darrell, so it's great. <laughs> uh, he, he wanted to leave us with, uh, with a question, and the question is about this uh, monolayer of strontium rutinate, which yeah, is okay. Yeah, and so okay. he's asking, uh, he's asking uh, are you willing to speculate about other materials e.g. manganites, where there has been a lot of discussion of their interface dead layers. Do you think that generically oxides will be metallic even down to the monolayer limit? So is strontium rutinate a very special case or do you think that if we can do perfect materials, we will achieve metallic oxides uh, with other materials at the monolayer level? Well, okay, this is, this is a great question. I, I um... So remember, I'm a synthesis person, and I'm, so I'm always hoping to improve interfaces, reduce defects. So I, I am personally very hopeful that uh, the dead layer in the manganites can be reduced. I've seen a lot of reduction of dead layers in my lifetime. <laughs> so um, Jean-Marc will remember you know, the, the concept of thin ferroelectrics and how these dead layers, and they were, they were, you know, 100 nanometers, uh, <laughs> just huge, huge things. So, and certainly in the, in the manganites, we've also seen that, that as the interfaces have gotten better and the control of the synthesis has gotten better, the dead layers have gotten thinner. Um, how much of it is intrinsic and how far it can be pushed, I don't know, but I'm optimistic. Okay, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there. Um, okay. I also, I should say, you know, the ruthenium oxide, I presented it and you know, I'm free to have my own opinions, but it's controversial. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> Great. I think it's good to be optimistic. <laughs> and I am too. Uh, we have one more question from Sitao, uh, uh, who is asking about uh, strontium titanate on disco. Maybe you can ask your question, please. Yeah, go ahead. I don't, uh, I, I see that your mic is on, but uh, try again. Uh, we cannot hear you, unfortunately. Maybe, maybe I can read your question. Um, okay, uh, thanks for the very nice talk and wonderful movies. Uh, in the first lecture, there is a 500 STO film on disco. Uh, sh okay, the question is, uh, sh this film, shouldn't it be relaxed? Excellent question. Okay, let me, well, I'll just, I'll talk my way through it. Okay. Um, the, the answer you want me is... to give you the other question? Okay, go ahead and no, I'll, there is, a, there, so there is it, another question. It, it is, so 500 angstroms, um, and it's about 1% uh, tensile, biaxial tensile strain, is well beyond the equilibrium critical thickness uh, that you would calculate from the Matthews uh, Blakesley uh, formula. So it is certainly, it is certainly metastable. Um, we've looked at it with the synchrotron. And what we see on the synchrotron is beyond about 40 uh, 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 nanometers, so 400 angstroms. Uh, we can start to see on the synchrotron the onset of, depth of uh, uh, relaxation. So relaxation doesn't happen immediately. It, it, takes, it takes some time. So 50, which I showed you, we can definitely see by the synchrotron, it's no longer fully commensurately strained. There is indeed a small amount of, of relaxation. Um, if we, we, we made films that were 100 nanometers thick, and at 100 nanometers, the film is totally cracking and delaminating and, and uh, nastiness appears in <laughs> AFM. So the, um, the, at the time, at the time we, we did that work, uh, I mean, first we, we measured the properties and we saw the ferroelectricity. Um, 
So we were very excited about it. Then later we went and did the synchrotron work and saw that it was indeed a, uh, some slight relaxation had occurred. It's not fully commensurate. That, that I, I, totally, I totally agree. So what we see for the onset for, is 400 angstroms for strontium titanate on disco where, we, where we're growing at around 700 degrees C. If we went to higher growth temperatures, I would expect, you know, like if we went to the 1200 degrees that, that John Mark grows at, I would expect the agreement to Matthews Blakesley would be very good that you can't kinetically, it's much easier to bring in defects when you're at these super high temperatures. Um, super high temperatures have the advantage that you can reduce point defects, okay? But they have a disadvantage that uh, relaxation happens where the energetics, much more closely to where the energetics say it should. It's a little long-winded answer, but hopefully. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm reading now question two, which is um, related to strontium vanadate and strontium rutenate. The question is, um, I imagine that, that in the system, you may suffer from the strontium oxide layer floating, uh, you know, what you explained, that it may eventually yeah. float to the surface. Yeah, um, this is, we're, we're, this is, well, that was a, that's a Redelson popper thing. That's a yeah, yeah. excess strontium. So I don't want to confuse the perovskite strontium ruthenate, you know, the 113 or the perovskite strontium vanadate 113 to when you have excess monolayer or mono layers uh, in the Rutleson power, but go, but go ahead. Yeah. No, I think this is the answer. I mean, oh, okay, okay. If you, if you grow pair of, okay, I'm, you know, I'm reading the, the the question, but I think if you're growing a pair of skies, it is not an issue. Correct. That is correct. And a lot of the, so you know, it's fun to it's fun to go beyond perovskites. But there's been decades of work on perovskites. So I would say, you know, as a community, we're very good at making perovskites. And although it's fun to get out of the box a bit, there's also um, things to be learned when you, to, to try to make your way out of the box. In a, in a <laughs> and that's where the Rettles and Poppers come in. That's a big, there's a, there's a lot of uh, excitement and learning to be done on the synthesis side in the Rettles okay. and Poppers. Uh, another question in, in this direction, still from Si Zhao, is, is, is asking, since you're a, a great specialist in substrates and you're making your own substrates, for De La Fossa materials, do you have any suggestion for a substrate? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> what could be better than a delophosite substrate? So, and in fact, if you, if you look in, um, maybe it's three months ago, Journal of Crystal Growth, you'll find one centimeter sized copper iron O2 delophosite single crystals grown at the Institute for Crystal Growth. Those are now substrates in our lab that we're about to grow films on. <laughs> so I think, you know, from, a, from an epitaxy standpoint, the best possible substrate is the same material. You know, you want to have the same motif. You want it to be well lattice matched. Nothing can be better. That's my, that's my view. <laughs> okay, and the last question. Thank you, uh, Si Zhao, for all this question all these questions um, and, and we may get some, uh, may, we may get the answer um, with the talk of Harold Wong uh, next week. So the question is, uh, lately there has been some studies on freestanding uh, ultrasound films and the question is if you, after lift off, if you consider these freestanding films, do you, do you get the bulk properties or is it still a signature or are there signatures of, of the fact that they've been grown uh, and oh. they've been strained at some point in their life. I see. Well, I think, I mean, I, I, um, I think the, uh, the ultimate way to, to do strain engineering is you, you grow at zero strain and then you lift off. Because, I mean, okay, so, so, you know, I talked about all the kind of defects and things that can come in when you try to strain things. The, the best to do would be to grow it at high temperature where you can, you can you know, um, make the defects as small as possible, okay? And then at room temperature, lift it off, and on this nice pristine material, then hit it with lots of strain, okay? I think that's, that's uh, from a thought perspective, I think that's the best possible way to do it. Now, in Harold's case, I'm, I, I hope you ask him um, how, uh, how, how he does it. He has certainly, um, he has, you know, huge strain. So 8.2% uh, uniaxial strain is a gigantic number. 
what he's starting with, I'm not sure it's a zero strain system. So, but Harold, Harold will know, you know, in terms of the substrate and then the, this um, soluble uh, buffer layer that he puts on top of it. Um, so whether, whether he starts at zero or slight strain, he, he doesn't start at 8.2%. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> and it's also, I mean, it's also a great question to ask, well, in the, in the membrane itself, that um, how do the properties of it compare to what it should be? in its unstrained state and then you know as you strain it and as you, and it's it's wonderful also it's the same sample it's not like you're comparing here's an unstrained sample that's grown on substrate x and here's a strained sample that's grown on substrate y um, that's not a it's not an optimal comparison to make you'd like to have you know the same material and now you you stretch it and you see how things evolve it's a very elegant uh, way of doing the experiment yeah. absolutely Thank you, Daryl. One more question from Gal. Gal, you can ask your question, please. Hi. Yes. Yeah, so uh, you said you will have to skip one part of your uh, talk because uh, there's not enough time about the proximity effects and uh, polarization uh, inducing. Maybe if you could just give an abridged version of that because it sounds uh, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I um no I, I can't I can't give up <laughs> yeah yeah no I um I mean I I, I can with with uh, with with uh, with with uh, I don't have it ready I don't have it ready yeah <laughs> sorry okay uh, I don't see any any uh, additional question if you have a question uh, this is the moment to ask Daryl. Uh, Otherwise, uh, if it is not the case, I think we will stop here. So Daryl, thank you very much for these two great lectures. It's been really a pleasure and thank you all for uh, being with us. Daryl, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Jean-Marc. Clapping for you. everyone. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the, the questions and hearing humans. Uh, it's nice to see humans and hear humans. It's very, very, it's very reassuring. <laughs> right. so, thank you again, Daryl, and I wish you all a, a very good day, a very good evening, or a very good night, depending where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.